Rash, bald-faced blasphemy. Question everything. I find it extremely hard to imagine. Open your eyes. It is quite all right to be an atheist. The fastest growing group of people in the country has been measured as being those who have no belief or who are atheists. You don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. Challenge the opposition. You see religion on a hundred fronts losing the argument. And start thinking. This is The Thinking Atheist Worldwide. It is the month of New Year's resolutions. It's funny. I actually started mine (laughs) in November of last year. I'd uh, seen myself on um, video at a speech or something. And I thought, you know, I... I look like I'm storing nuts in my cheeks or something. (laughs) I just look a little bit, a little large. And as I'm approaching the age of 45, I thought, all right, fine. So I I set a goal, got a trainer, you know, and of course we're out there doing all this. It's, It's obscene. We're out there in a parking lot. We're flipping tractor tires. You know, all right, I want you to get down here. I want you to flip this tire 20 times. Excuse me. Then I want you to give me 30 burpees. Do you have any idea what a burpee is? If there is a devil, it is a crea- he created the burpee. Essentially what you do, if I'm doing it right, and I don't know, you, you start at a standing position you got to drop down to the floor like you're going to do a push-up. But you don't do a push-up. You have your legs tucked underneath you. You have to thrust them out, then back underneath you, and then you pop up in the air like a piece of popcorn. And your body's just not meant to do that. It's just not natural. And the idea of doing more than three is <laughs> just obscene. Excuse me? Get on your face and give me a burpee. A, a burpee? So anyway, I've been doing that since late November, slacked off a little bit over the holiday, but slowly but surely edging toward a leaner, meaner me. You know, I just, I, I quite frankly, if it's something that I, I just wanted to try to do. Natalie and I were sitting in front of the television the other night, and of course now we're, we're cognizant of the fact that the advertisers are running weight loss ads every three seconds. Everything from the Nutrisystem to this, you know, I don't know, Slim Fast to this way, this gym and P90X and the insanity where all these other things going on, right? And the ones that stick out to me the most are the ones where they charge usually an exorbitant amount of money. It seems like there was one last year or the year before, and it was 150 bucks a bottle. Okay. And they pitch it like this. This formula is much too powerful for those who only want to lose 10, 20, or 30 pounds. No, no, this is only for those who need to lose 30 or more pounds. Well, it's a brilliant marketing scheme because people are going to go, oh, hell yeah, I'd like to lose more than 30 pounds. Here's my credit card number. I see versions of these on television. We saw one again the other night. All you have to do is take this miracle pill, take this pill, and you're going to get skinny. You're going to be the new you, or you're going to recapture the old you. And then they have the testimonials of people who say, I used to weigh 275 pounds, and I just took this little pill, and look at me now. And they have this amazingly ripped body in a bikini, and you're like, wow, that's an amazing pill. And then you look down at the bottom of the screen, and you see... Fine print. And I've heard a saying that says there's never, ever any good news in fine print. And it says something along the lines of, and you've seen these, this product has not been regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. Has not been evaluated by them. Results not typical. Weight loss obtained in conjunction with diet and exercise, which brings about the obvious question. Wait a minute. If I'm doing the diet 
and I'm exercising, why do I need your little pill at 150 bucks a crack? Uh, wh- what is that about? I was on uh, WebMD. I was reading an article about uh, people who had been duped by uh, these types of claims. And obviously the reason that they reappear is because diet scams work. Lose 30 pounds in 30 days. Block fat. Block carbs. Calories. Block everything. It just passes right through your body. Your your whole internal organs, your intestine turns into a big slip and slide. And all that fat, just eat what you want, people. Mm -hmm. Just buy our product. And people say, I want that. Here's my money. The top five diet scams, according to uh, WebMD. Metabolism boosting pills based on herbal ingredients, fat and carb blocking pills, herbal weight loss teas, diet patches, diet jewelry, or other products worn on the body, or body wraps and slim suits. According to the article, a recent Federal Trade Commission report found that more than half of the weight loss ads that ran in 2001 made at least one, at least one false or unsubstantiated claim. And yet they continue to persist and people continue to be bilked. Now it sounds good. I want to believe it. I want to believe it. You kid, I want, I can have cheese nachos tonight and I can just take this little pill and look, I'll, I'll look like Hugh Jackman when it's over. I want that pill. Give it to me, please. Here, take it. Take my money. But when you go deeper and you look at it and you say, I, I, I'm going to look at it honestly, you find out the truth falls somewhere else. And this is the case with a great many things. Now, I'm an atheist, right? I'm supposed to look at my life. I'm supposed to look at the world, the universe around me with an eye of skepticism. And yet sometimes I find myself being unskeptical. Sometimes I just, here's a great example My uh, computer fan, the blower, started making this unholy sound. Took it apart. Took a look at it. Put it back together. Started the computer. It was fine. For about a day. The next day, it's, it, it continues to make this. It sounds like a grinding sound. Well, the fan, perhaps the fan needs lubricated. Now... This is not my area, people. I'm good with software. I can do video and audio editing programs out the yin-yang. Left-handed and blindfolded. No problem. Open up a computer tower and I can wreak some havoc. I don't don't have a history of doing it. I don't know the terminology. You want me to do what? What plugs into what? And inevitably, I usually end up paying someone else. And people say, oh, it's easy, man. It's easy. Man, you save some money. You can get it done a whole lot faster. The part's cheap. Just screw it in there. It's not a problem. So I decide, (laughs) hey, I I got this. I'll just take a look at it. Right? Did I apply skepticism to this problem? I do not think so. Unplug everything. Take the tower up and pull it out. And there's this uh, big old fan right on top of the CPU. And I decide, hmm, I think I'm going to get in there and see if something needs to be, I don't know, sprayed with lubricant. Now, I'm in a hurry. <laughs> right? I'm not doing the, I'm not looking online to see. I'm not checking the part number, the model number. I just thought, I'm just going to take a screwdriver and I'm just going to unscrew this thing. And I paid for that decision. I was sitting there, I'm sitting on the, you know, I've got everything kind of spread around. I'm sitting down here. I take, I take a screwdriver and I don't know which screw I was on. (laughs) I'm embarrassed to tell you the story. I I really am, but it's such a good story. I'm, I'm on, I don't know what screw I was on. And all of a sudden about a quarter cup of liquid pours out. On to me. Fortunately, it wasn't over any of the computer components. It wasn't over the motherboard or the t- wouldn't he? I happened to have it out over the carpet. All of a sudden, this this waterfall of something comes out of the freaking fan. Now, I'm not expecting this because, in my mind, it is a fan. 
Fans do not have liquid in them. Oh, no, they do. Some of them do. This is a liquid-cooled system. And I just I got in such a hurry that I didn't even stop to think about it. The liquid-cooled systems we have at the office have these clear, transparent tubes that you can actually see the coolant go through them. Didn't occur to me that, no, I wouldn't be able to see it. So I literally spill the coolant all over the place. Now, by the time I get done, I've ruined it. I got to go online. I got to order the replacement, have it FedExed. And today, finally, I take the tower in there. And, and after looking, I don't know how many websites and YouTube videos and tutorials I went through for the basic procedure of reinstalling this stupid thing, I did what I should have done in the first place. I got educated, getting information from the people who know how to do it. And I'll tell you, when that sucker cranked up and started to purr, I will say I felt a testosterone boost at that moment. I felt, I felt a few extra chest hairs at that moment. <laughs> yes, uh, like you, you dominated. It took me a while to get there, but then you did. I, honestly, the money I had to pay for the fan, I feel like maybe it was going out anyway. But I feel like it was a stupid tax. I just, I was penalized for not using my brain for not taking for getting impatient for jumping to conclusions you know for being out of my depth and and i think a lot of us in many cases are like that i'm amazed even on our own pages you will see someone who is a, a skeptic about god and in other areas of their life they they they're guilty of a lack of skepticism or I'm, I'm not talking about people who examine the evidence and come to a different opinion. And that's something I do want to cover quickly before we get into our calls. And I've got Michael Shermer of Skeptic Magazine, our special guest on the show. He'll be joining me here in about 15, 20 minutes. I'm not talking about people who look at a circumstance, a situation, evaluate the evidence, and they simply come to a different conclusion than you do. And this is a problem. I'm, I'm talking about those people who just, they have continued to embrace an irrational belief while being super skeptical about something else. And we're not going to, we're not going to rag on the truthers. I mean, th this stuff may come up and I know I, I already on the Facebook page, everybody's like, we're going to talk about 9-11 the entire show. No, we're not. We're going to talk about this the entire show. I don't know. I'm not sure what's going to come up. But the overall thing is, are there people who are unskeptical atheists? And of course, I think we are all at times guilty, some more than others. Now, again, I, I honestly think it's fascinating to live in a culture where we can both look at the same evidence. You and I will both look at the same circumstance and we will come to a different conclusion. Honestly, I welcome that. It used to be a time that I was threatened by that. I think part of that was because I was religious especially when I was younger. Someone comes to me and they say, well, no, I disagree, and here's why. Uh, whether it's politically or whether it's something else, you find yourself immediately becoming protective or on the defensive or insecure or what have you. I love interacting with people who disagree with me, usually, provided that we just disagree. And it is possible to look at something from a different perspective. I look, I look at something, you look at something, we come to a different conclusion. It doesn't mean one of us is out of our minds crazy or religious about our beliefs. And this is the charge you normally hear on the Facebook. I see it all the time on the Facebook page. You're just being religious about this. You're just being religious, which is a way to insult and marginalize someone who has a disagreeing opinion. No, it's a great big world out there. And there are people, believe it or not, as you look down from your superior perch, there are people who have examined the same evidence that you have, and they simply came to a different conclusion. They have a different opinion. Now, we can explore that, but it doesn't mean they're idiots, doesn't mean that they are religious, doesn't mean that they have lost their mind. Spirited debate, wonderful. Please, let's have it. But the insults and the marginalizations, come on. When did we stop having the ability to have a conversation, to have a discussion? I had an email in from Greg. He said, I know a few atheists who believe in ghosts. In fact, one of them is a paranormal investigator. He goes to various haunted, quote unquote, haunted places with recording equipment. He has posted what is essentially white noise. Shh on Facebook and translated phrases he believes he heard in that noise. I love this, by the way. 
It's a little creepy when, when it's done right. Greg continues, to me, it's a bit like playing records backwards. It's not really words you're hearing, but you get something you want to hear out of it. In any case, he insists he has seen ghosts, but thinks religion is complete bullshit. Incidentally, he also believes in reincarnation. I'm not sure how he reconciles these two positions. His sister believes in reincarnation, too. Greg says, I know a great many more atheists who aren't the least bit skeptical about evolution. Now, that might sound strange, but hear me out. These are people in the atheist community who believe in evolution because they think it goes with the territory of being an atheist, but they don't really know anything about it. Instead of admitting they don't know, they'll spout erroneous claims out of ignorance. Evolution has nothing to do with being an atheist. I read the Bible and found it all full of contradictions, atrocities, absurdities, and factual errors. However, I do know quite a bit about evolution and the non-skeptical atheist who butcher the theory without knowing anything about it bothers me. They should investigate their own claims and the claims of believers so they can properly educate themselves and stop making those of us in the know cringe at their ignorance. This reminds me, I had someone, I believe it was posted on the Answers in Genesis page, but it's a believer, put together a very slick video. Uh, it's obvious a lot of time in the production room was done on this, and that's what scares me about it. Let me pull it up very quickly so I can give you the title. Uh, let's see, he... It was a response to my Creation Museum video. And, um, you know, Ken Ham had already featured that sucker on his page and lampooned me and done this and that. And uh, the video that was done, and I approved it for a video response uh, to Atheist at the Creation Museum, was Evolution Refuted. And it's a very slick presentation. And my fear is, is that somebody who is a casual YouTube user is going to see this and say, wow, this is so well produced, it must be an authoritative source. And this happens. I mean, you know, if they see something and go, wow, this must have been done by a reputable organization. And uh, they're dealing horribly, by the way, with uh, the issues of abiogenesis and whatnot. I mean, they're not, a lot of it's not even about evolution. And, and, and I found myself thinking, I don't want to give this, I don't want to give this guy any more hits than I have to. But also I think the worst, the greater evil is to allow these assertions to go unrefuted. And so I posted it on Facebook and said, please, if you would respectfully go and provide some counter arguments, please, some refutations, give them some good sources. Let's make sure that if there's a casual user who stumbles upon this, this fiction, that they at least see that there is a sea of people who think it's complete crap and have the science to back it up. There's so many good resources out there. And it's funny because we're still we're still refuting the old the same old claims, even packaged in new and exciting ways. You know, it, it makes me crazy. Um, let's take a call. If I can get back to the switchboard here, I've got so many windows open and I'm multitasking. My multitasking skills are not amazing. Uh, 513, there we go. You're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. Who's this? It's Mario. Mario, thanks for calling. Welcome to the show. What do you have for us tonight? Well, I, I've got three three things. Um, you, you mentioned your incident with the computer. Um, consider a blind guy trying to fix his plumbing. And Mario, and I I've lived it. To... I, you know, I lived it you know and and i learned my lessons the hard way and that's just how yep. i roll so that, what yeah, else you think the same thing actually i'm i'm interested in uh the fact that you have michael Shermer. i, I read all of his stuff and um i i'm fascinated by his um theory you know the, the false positive idea of why we believe mm -hmm. and uh it's interesting to me because um what he's saying is that believing is really not so much about truth as much it is really just a cost benefit analysis you know what what does it cost me to believe or not to believe rather than asking the question wh what is true if i may i'll elaborate for those who may not be familiar with Shermer's. um okay he i think he calls it a type one positive type two positive something like that where if you are yep. you're an animal in the forest and you hear a rustling in the in the woods is it a carnivorous beast waiting to kill you, or is it just the wind? Well, if it's a carnivorous beast, then the consequences of being wrong are you're dead. 
If it's just the wind and you're wrong, well, there are no consequences. So we have sort of evolved this sense to go ahead and err on the side of caution, to to lean that direction. Do you think that's a fair explanation of what he's trying to say? Uh, I would I would add one thing. Uh, I wouldn't emphasize so much that you're dead as much as the fact that you, you, you are dead at a point where you may not be able to replicate or procreate. That's the key. Um, you know, the, the uh, analogy I give, which is very similar to Michael, but I add a little bit of uh, uh, what, I, what I imagine is, you know, imagine our ancestors, two of them, and they're hunting in the woods. And, uh, you know, the same scenario, they hear a, a noise behind the bush. Well, one responds by believing it's a predator and instantly runs. The other, being a skeptic, wonders, well, you know, is it really a predator? And he goes to investigate, okay? Well, the, the guy that runs will always live to replicate, to procreate. The one who investigates, he has a good chance of never making it. And so he's out of the gene pool. And, and so the, the evolution favors the believer. And I don't think the argument is that it is a good or bad thing. I think it is just no, no. the way it is. I don't think anyone's assigning right. a good or bad connotation to it. It's just the way well, we evolved. Well, that's absolutely. And, if, you know, the fact that evolution is, is a mindless process, it doesn't always change things for the better. You know, an example I always give is uh, the antlers, you know, of a moose. You know, the bigger the antler... Um, the more likely they can attract a mate. However, when it gets a certain size, it becomes a danger because it gets entangled in the trees and the bushes, and they can die. So it's you see, it's not necessarily always a good thing. And and I think this idea of wanting to believe something um, is is probably something we need to undo, you know, over time. Sure. Now that we're more aware you know, of our decision-making process, it can sort of affect how we deal with those situations, perhaps in a more rational yeah. way. What was your third thing? Yeah. Well, um, you know, third thing is I'm, I'm actually more concern, concerned about the reverse. People who are skeptics in almost everything they do, but they throw skepticism out the window when it comes to religion. And, and the example that comes to mind is uh, Francis Collins. It just makes you wonder how they, how they do that. How, no, how you're not you talking about an atheist, though. At this measure, if you're talking Collins, right. you're talking about the evangelical. I, th I think Shermer okay, deals yeah. with a lot of that, and it may come up. I mean, we, you know, okay. how can someone who is a scientist who is, has sharpened his mind in so many areas then also believe or hold true a book that that talks about giants and 900 year old men and and leviathons and stuff you know how do you how does that happen and that's uh no, right. that's a lot he's done a lot of work he can certainly speak to it better than i can but i'll see if we can bring it up for you okay yeah sure thing all right thanks for calling man take care bye Seth. we cover the um the that scenario about the you know the guy in the in the forest in a previous episode this will be the third time michael Shermer's been on my podcast i'm so glad he, he's agreed to do it again but uh, he he deals a bit more with that i think we're going to try to move past that today um i had an email in from kent he said regardless of your intake on these issues it's how you get there and how you defend them that makes you reasonable or not i've seen a lot of dogmatic zealotry being thrown around by otherwise reasonable people on either sides of these issues. Thank you very much, Ken. Jessica said, I met one guy at an atheist convention who believed uncritically in Reiki, R-E-I-K-I. -E he could not be persuaded that his reasoning was shoddy. I was dumbstruck. Well, Jessica, I'd never heard of Reiki, so I looked it up, and it's crazy. According to the Skeptic's Dictionary, Reiki is a form of energy healing that centers on the manipulation of ki, K-I, the Japanese version of chi. Rei, R-E-I, means spirit in Japanese, so reiki literally means spirit life force. This guy's an atheist? 
Like their counterparts in traditional Chinese medicine who use acupuncture, as well as their counterparts in the West, I'm reading from the Skeptic's Dictionary now, as well as their counterparts in the West who use therapeutic touch, the practitioners of Reiki believe that health and disease are a matter of the life force being disrupted. Belief in a life force known as vitalism was common in the West until the 19th century. Since then, the concept of life force has joined phlogiston, P-H-L-O-G-I-S-T-O-N, wow, ether, and many other superannuated ideas on the rubbish heap of discarded scientific notions. The belief in vitalism is still strong in China, India, where the life force is called prana, Africa, animism, and Japan. Each believes the universe is full of some sort of vital energy that cannot be detected by any scientific instruments, but, but which can be felt and controlled often by special people who learn the tricks of the trade. Reiki healers differ from acupuncturists in that they do not try to unblock a person's key. This is just getting better and better, Jessica. <laughs> I'm sorry, where was I? Reiki healers don't try to unblock a person's key, but to channel the key of the universe so that the client or patient heals. The channeling is done with the hands. And like therapeutic touch, no physical massaging is necessary. Since key flows through the body of the healer into the patient, the Reiki master claims to be able to draw upon the energy of the universe and increase his or her own energy while performing a healing. Reiki healers claim to channel key into ill or injured individuals for, quote, rebalancing. Depending on the training and beliefs of the healer, Reiki is used to treat a wide array of ailments. Larry Arnold and Sandra Nevins claim in the Reiki Handbook, 1992, that Reiki is useful for treating brain damage, cancer, diabetes, and venereal diseases. Many Reiki healers are more modest and treat lesser problems such as fatigue or muscle soreness. I was, this is the writer of the article, I was once treated by a Reiki practitioner for a wrist injury. The treatment didn't work because I was a non-believer or so I was told. If the healing fails, and it will inevitably fail for such things as cancer, it is because the patient is, quote, resisting the healing energy. Non-belief is one of the great blocks to healing energy. Interesting that I have found many people who are non-believers who will embrace stuff like uh, spiritual healing. I had one guy who was talking about a, a, a membrane of consciousness that binds the world together. And I'm like, what have you been smoking? Um, or they, you know, they talk heavily about the supernatural and, and uh, orbs and life forms and dead relatives visiting them in the night. And, you know, all this type of stuff that seems to fall under the religion category. How do you reconcile that? 435, you're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Who's this? Um, hi, this is Jack. I'm, I'm uh, 16 and I'm from Utah. It's great to meet you, Jack. Thanks for calling the show tonight. It's great to meet you, too. I'm, I'm really excited to get a chance to talk online. Oh, I love um, it when young people call the show, man. There. I love when young people call and participate in these discussions. The more it happens, the happier I am. So welcome. What do you think, man? I have this one friend, and he was raised atheist just like I was, and he um, he's a little more he's self described he's self described as a militant atheist. So we get into we so we get into a few discussions, and one of the more recent ones that we had was one where he was angry that people could bring religious symbols into school, and this is Utah, and although I live in a pretty liberal town, there's still there's still a huge amount of relig of religious influence. So I was having a debate with him about whether or not, and he he considers himself a Levian Satanist, and he had a lot of fun with the show that you did on that. So um, he was planning on coming in with a shirt that said, Say You Love Satan on it. And so <laughs> while this may not exactly be as far as uh, not being skeptical about certain things goes, it does seem to lack a little bit of common sense, in my opinion. What was his motivation? He was just trying to stir the pot and get people jacked up, or what? That 
was essentially it. And he was um, his argument was that it's better for us to have some. It's better for us to have negative attention than no attention. And I'm trying to say. Well, listen, many of the studies have shown that we have 20% of the population in the United States. We're not exactly unnoticeable, and especially in especially in the town that I live in. But, I mean, in spite of the fact that he doesn't believe in Satan or God, he, he, he thought that bringing in a shirt that says, say you, say you love Satan on it could be beneficial, I guess. I think it honestly speaks to temperament in many cases. I mean, now there are a lot of factors that come into play, but some people, quite frankly, just have an antagonistic personality. They love to turn the screw. They get a kick out of stirring the pot and seeing how people react. And they have a variety of motivations that drive that. Sometimes I think it's good to provoke. Sometimes it's good to get people a little bit worked up. And sometimes I honestly think you're doing more harm than good. It's really situational, in my opinion. You have to, who are you talking to? What environment are you in? What are your specific circumstances and how much will you really get out of getting people all frothing at the mouth <laughs> you know i mean part of me am- admires his brass and part of me thinks well you know what what's your end zone what are you trying to accomplish so i appreciate you listening to the yeah. show my friend and uh, thanks for calling and and uh, have a wonderful new year all right you too seth all right take it easy Let's talk to a skeptic among skeptics. He is the founder and president of Skeptic Magazine. He's been on television uh, recently. He did Stossel, and he's uh, quite frequently seen on the debate circuit. He's done this show several times, and he's back tonight. Michael Shermer, thank you so much for being here. Oh, you're welcome. I just saw uh, recently your post on Facebook uh, detailing a hip replacement surgery that you went through, and it was crazy. Yeah, it is. It's pretty amazing uh, what they can do with Modern medicine, yeah. No, I had a, I've had a bum hip for a couple of years, just uh, probably too many miles on my bike and crashes and whatnot. So I was in a lot of pain and limping around. So it was time, and uh, gosh, they knocked this thing out in under two hours. And I was walking the next day and home two days later. And uh, that's you know that's the miracles of modern medicine. Uh, you know, not just a century ago, but even a few decades ago, they, I wouldn't have been able to do this, anything like this. So we are fortunate talking about a lot of the procedures that we used to do, you know, even 5, 10, 20 years ago that were invasive and you were in the hospital for weeks and now it's outpatient. They do laparoscopic or some some modified version of the procedure and you're out and about. You were walking the next day? Oh, yeah. They they want you up fairly quickly and the, the, um, the joint itself is full weight-bearing right away. It's the muscles that they cut and pull and all the tendons and ligaments that have to tighten up. So it'll be a couple of months before I'm back on my bike, but um, but in terms of just walking around, I can walk without a cane or walker or anything like that. In fact, the physical therapist came yesterday, and I walked out to the driveway to greet him in his car, and he's looking at me like, well, where's the patient? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm the patient. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, like oh, okay. And by the way, I, I wanted to say... I wanted to say great job on Stossel. Uh, I had someone tell me, hey, you should check out the Stossel program. He's going to have Shermer on, and he's going to have some atheists. He's going to have Krauss on and some others speaking with and to the clergy. And uh, I thought I thought the free thought side of that particular, maybe I'm biased, I thought the free thought side held up pretty well. I got the vibe also. I think they only showed like 10 minutes. Did you guys must have talked for a lot longer, right? Yeah, I think they taped about... 30 minutes of it and they used I think it was like 12, 11 or 12 minutes on the on the air but you can see the entire debate at Intelligence Squared if you go to if you just Google Intelligence Squared you'll find the entire debate we did that night uh, which was filmed and that was an, about an hour and a half uh, program including a bizarre question from a woman in the audience that turned out to be the actress Andy McDowell uh, she wanted to know about orchids uh, <laughs> find, could find Orchids. How do you explain the orchid? Uh, to which I said something about, well, plant breeders, uh, they've been breeding these plants for a long time. So, yeah, we can do that. Of course, what she meant was, yeah, but where did the orchid come from in the first place? And all the way back to, you know, where did life come from and where did the universe come from? You know, so Lawrence fielded the universe one and I fielded the life one. And, you know, we, we have pretty good explanations for these things now. Not, you know, not 100%, but, um, you know, for most people, they don't, it, unless it's, a really satisfying answer. They just seem to prefer the God did it answer, which is, of course, no answer at all because scientists want to know, well, how did God do it? Uh, You know, what forces are used? How did it happen? And, you know, that's always the problem with supernatural explanations is they're not explanations at all. They just, they just punt on the, on the answer and, and, uh, 
and leave you hanging with, well, you know, but but how did how did the creator do it? Uh, much like if you found an intelligent, it turned out like the 2001 scenario was right. The Arthur C. Clarke story that it was um, you know aliens that planted the seed of humanity in uh, hominids. Um, well, that wouldn't so that wouldn't still wouldn't answer the question because where did the aliens get their intelligence from? How did how did, how did that happen? So at some point you you need a natural explanation, not not a top down but a bottom up natural process of how how things happen and that's the job of science and you know that was the main point i made i took uh, a line from christopher hitchens speech at the google from years ago where he said arguments that explain everything explain nothing which i think sums it up pretty well you know everything if it's if it's yeah. a catch-all for everything well we're, we probably need to keep looking you know right you also need um what are called exogenous explanations as opposed to endogenous, that is, external sources for causes of things. Uh, Pinker makes this point nicely in his book, um, The Decline of Violence, that <clears throat> you can't just say, well, uh, violence has declined because people have become less violent. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't explain anything. It's just repeating the problem in different words. Um, and, and that's actually the case with all of science. Um, you know, you can't, it's not really, it's really not enough to just say, well, you know, what is, gra you know, pl planets are held together uh, in a solar system by gravity. Well, what's gravity? Gravity is the tendency to hold planets together in a solar system. <laughs> you know, it's just repeating it. You, you, you know, we need, we need to get to the bottom of the explanation. It's the same thing with consciousness. You know, you can say, well, consciousness is uh, the product of neurons firing. Well, you know, what are neurons, how do neurons fire? Well, now we have to get down to, you know, molecules and ions and, dopamine and synapses and you know at some point we need a mechanical bottom-up reductionistic explanation and for some reason people seem to be bothered by that on certain certain issues they don't mind it on medical issues for example it's like yeah let's get to the heart of cancer and find out what the what the dna is of it everybody's happy with that but if you go for like the mechanical explanations of morality or origins of life in the universe that you know that makes people get nervous talking here with Michael Shermer. We're going to talk about unskeptical skepticism or atheism. But I really I think I want to start with the religious because it it's a great tie-in. There is a tendency if someone comes to let's say I'm a believer and I've cherished my faith for decades and this has been true in my past and someone came to me and said there is no god and your bible it's demonstrably false. My first instinct really is not to say wow that's amazing. Let me go deeper. Let me go find out that the infer. Let me let me explore this new this new argument. My first instinct is to circle the wagons and to, and to sort of be protective. Is that common? Totally common. It's true for all belief systems, and that would be the case. Um, you know, if you were a liberal and a and, and a conservative friend have said, you know, hey, you know, I have some arguments on why gun control is a bad idea. And you're a liberal who believes in gun control. You're, you're not going to. You're really not going to hear the arguments. You're not going to evaluate the data in any objective sense. None of us do. You're just going to automatically put the brick wall up. And that's why there has to be a psychology of influence, which there is a whole field of study in psychology of how to influence people, how to get them to change their minds. This is what you know admin and marketing people do for a living. And uh, so you you can't just you know, knock on somebody's door and say, the products you're using uh, really suck and you're an idiot for using them, you know, you're going to get the door slammed in your face. And it's the same thing with religion and politics. You know, there has to be a way of approaching the subject with, you know, respect and and uh, honoring somebody's uh, intelligence. Just don't assume they're idiots because they disagree with you. You have to assume they're just as smart as you and they're believing for some other reason and then try to get to the heart of that reason. And, and, uh, and it's all you can really do on the, on the God question or political question for that matter is just to plant a seed of doubt and just say, well, you know, yeah, you could be right. Maybe I'm wrong, but, you know, have you thought of it this way or have you thought of it that way? Or uh, like a favorite tactic of mine with creationists, the young earth creationists, is to use uh, the arguments and books and, and cite people like Ken Miller or, or um, others that have written books that completely accept all science, and they still, they're evangelicals, they believe in God and Jesus as their Savior and so on. Now, of course, I don't believe that, but if those evangelicals accept all of science, um, then then I, I think that's a way of lowering the barrier. Um, like Francis Collins' book, uh, The Language of God, he's got a terrific chapter in there on how we know 
humans evolved just by DNA. And, uh, you know, I just show that to every young recreationist I encounter. And just like, here, this guy's on your camp. He, he accepts Jesus as his savior. And he thinks, he, uh, you know, humans evolved. Uh, and here's the proof. And that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a really good way of lowering the barrier because then, then they don't feel like it's just some extreme atheist like me trying to convince them and take away their belief. It's like somebody on their side. And so that's a good, good approach. What about people who have rejected the idea of God, but in many other areas of their life are not as skeptical? Maybe they allow themselves to be, you know, they say you're so open-minded, your brain falls out kind of a thing. I mean, you've seen evidence <laughs> yeah. that it, just because someone rejects a deity does not mean that they are not maybe susceptible to other types of, I don't want to say deception, but bad information, that kind of thing. You've seen this in, in your own circle? Totally, yeah. Well, uh, Bill Maher is a case in point. You know, he's an atheist and obviously a very smart guy, and um, he, he can truly evaluate the arguments as well as anybody of just about any topic. And yet he, you know, when it comes to uh, things where he thinks that some corporation is making a profit or some government agency is in the pocket of a of a corporation or a, a lobbyist or something like that, the science goes out the window and he just follows his politics. You know, he's a progressive liberal, and progressive liberals are pretty far left, and they become conspiratorial. So, you know, that's when Maurer was, spoke out against vaccines and, you know, that kind of thing. And and uh, so when Dawkins gave him the you know, Atheist of the Year Award because he produced that film, The Ligilist, um, you know, a lot of skeptics and atheists were a little uncomfortable with that, and there was some pushback because it's like, well, this is this is honoring somebody who's, you know, by Dawkins, who's like a pro-science guy, and, and Maurer is completely throwing science out the window when it comes to a lot of these medical issues. And so um, that that's an example of, you know, a smart person who believes a weird thing, and you know, in my book, Why People Believe Weird Things, I answer the question at the end, why do smart people believe weird things? And the answer is because they're better at rationalizing beliefs they arrived at for non-smart reasons, which is to say most of our beliefs we hold for non-smart reasons. We don't uh, you know, really evaluate the data and, and draw the logical conclusion. We believe first for other reasons and then back into it with arguments, and smart people are better at doing that. So we're all subject to that. So you're saying that if I was indoctrinated with kind of a crazy mythology, later in life it's easier for me to attack that because I initially accepted it for a non-smart reason? Am I catching that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a lot of my uh, friends that are still climate uh, skeptics or global warming skeptics, they feel that um, skeptics are on the wrong side of this argument, that they're, they're, being, they're being taken or accepting a mythology and that – and that global warming is kind of a secular religion, and environmentalists are like secular religionists um, who believe this mythology about global warming. And, and you know, they, they point to websites and uh, data sets that uh, apparently support their position and so on, and they, they make that argument. So that, that's an example of, um, you know, of what skepticism is. Are you skeptical of global warming? Or are you skeptical of the global warming skeptics? So here, skepticism is not a thing. It's not a you know a, a position you always staked out no matter what on this side or that side. It depends on the particular claim. I really enjoyed the uh, magazine. You guys actually did an edition of Skeptic Magazine on global warming. I come from that camp. We came from watching in full living color the wild hypocrisy of Al Gore and many of the celebrity global warming champions, right? And instead of exploring the yeah. argument, I was deflecting off of the the lack of credibility, in my opinion, from the people who were championing global warming. And I myself have had to get educated to try to understand what it is, how it works. And 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 honestly, my position on the issue is really broadening, which I, I found is the case in a lot of ways. Once you start to change how you approach this stuff, you well, once you start challenging God, it becomes a little easier, at least in my life, to start challenging some of the other stuff you always took for granted. Right. Yep, exactly. Well, that's true. I, I was a global warming skeptic for quite a while, actually, because I could see over the decades, since the 70s, that the environmental movement was a kind of religion. It was sort of a, um, you know, it had its own, like, doomsday scenario, almost like the apocalypse is coming. We're going to, you know, run out of oil and uh, and precious minerals and, and resources and overpopulation and pollution and the ozone hole and, 
so on, and the, you know, the rainforest would all be gone by the 1990s, and none of that happened. Um, you know, there's there's still environmental issues for sure, uh, but I do think that environmental groups tend to exaggerate, and part of it is just an artifact of that's how you raise money. You know, if you if you're a if you're a social activist group and you say things are getting better, you know, the the donations are going to go down. If you say things are bad and getting worse and we have to do something to stop it, please send your money. You know, donations go up. So I think there's an artifact built into there uh, that distorts things. You know, nevertheless, I think global warming is real. I think the evidence is pretty solid on that now, and, and, and it's primarily human cause. But I do think there's plenty of room for debate about, like, how much warmer it's going to get. I think that's not clear. And what time frame, like over the next century or two or three, and then what the consequences will be. I mean, there, there certainly will be some consequences, but... You know, we have to weigh in the balance how much money we're going to spend to address the problem versus other places to spend the money that could also save lives, like mosquito nets, for example, are a cheap way to save you know a lot of lives. And the sorts of things that Bill Gates does with his money, I think, is really productive. Uh, just you know, potable water, toilets, you know, just really basic stuff for third world countries, uh, I think, is a lot more productive use of our resources. Um, than, say, what some of the environmentalists are suggesting we do about reducing uh, global warming greenhouse gases. Um, but, you know, it's not clear that uh, we can even do it very effectively in the next century, and, 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 and we could end up spending a ton of money doing it. And so, you know, I think there's just more immediate uses of our time and resources. I wonder if people don't... They think others aren't going to listen unless it's an extreme case scenario. Like it's not just, wow, they're, the planet's being effective, but the world will end, that kind of thing. It's almost like when you're yes. de debating someone, it, this is not just an antagonist, someone that I have a personal disagreement with. This person is the devil. You know, they are this horrible person. <laughs> I think yes. we, we tend to right. paint others in extremes in order to maybe get attention and sort of rally the troops for our cause. I don't know if there's merit to that. Oh, for sure. That's why I put those two characterizations of liberals and conservatives in the, in the believing brain that, you know, it's kind of funny, but it's but it's true, too, uh, you know, that uh, actually I'll pull it up here for you. It's, it's, uh, it is kind of amusing. But, uh, I mean, your point is that uh, the extremes that we, we use to color other people, it, it's a way of it's, – it's tribalism, right? It's just basic tribalism, and it's a way we have of, you know, circling the wagons and – uh, you know, making our, our opponents, well, demonizing them. It makes it easier to not take them seriously, not take their arguments seriously. So uh, here's how liberals see conservatives. Conservatives are a bunch of Hummer-driving, meat-eating, gun-toting, small government-promoting, tax-decreasing, hard-drinking, Bible-thumping, black-and-white-thinking, fist-pounding, shoe-stopping, morally dogmatic blowhards. <laughs> and here's what conservatives think of liberals. Liberals are a bunch of hybrid, hybrid driving, tofu eating, tree hugging, whale saving, sandal wearing, big government promoting, tax increasing, bottle water drinking, flip flopping, wishy washy, mamby pamby bedwetters. <laughs> 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 uh, but let's say that that's what uh, you know. I mean, it, 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 they're they're exaggerations, but not by much. Yeah. You know, yeah. you listen to Rush Limbaugh or Hannity or, or Bill O'Reilly. You know, I mean, Bill O'Reilly is famous for his you know pinhead. Uh, adjectives to describe liberals. I mean, that's that. These are the characterizations people use. This isn't really a political show. I'm just curious. Your politics really falls somewhere in the middle. I mean, you're you're left on this. Show. I I hate the words left and right, but you're more conservative. You're more liberal. You're you you really have kind of a. You must take a lot of heat from many in the free thought community. Which oh, I do. Yeah, absolutely. I'm uh, I'm what what would loosely be called a libertarian, uh, but you know, I'm fiscally conservative, socially liberal. Um, you know, I'm. But definitely, you know, pro-choice, for example, separation of church and state. Um, you know, a, a lot of issues with liberals. I'm right, you know, right down the middle with them on civil liberties and so on. But, but fiscally, uh, I'm much more conservative. I catch a little bit of that myself, and then what I normally get is, how can you be so rational about superstition and be such an idiot? about this particular political cause or, you know, I mean, did they, I mean, I take a lot of heat for being a, you know, I'm kind of a fiscal conservative. I'm kind of a small government type. I'm not, I don't brand myself libertarian because I, I don't think the platform itself completely defines me, but there are many areas I lean libertarian on and, and you must, you must hear it every day. Oh, I do. Right. I even have a, 
characterization of libertarians as a bunch of electric car driving, fusion food eating, pot smoking, porn watching, <laughs> prostitution supporting, gold hoarding, gun stashing, constitution waving, secession mongering, tax revolting, anti government anarchists. Wow. Wow. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I, I try to. The moment, to... you, the moment you say the label, the moment you say the label, that's what people think. Oh, you're one of those. Yeah, I was talking to Aaron Raw about it, and he was like, "You can't be a libertarian." I'm like, "I'm not a libertarian, but I have some libertarian leanings." Anyway, I, did, I didn't want it to become a political show. Everybody, uh, the comment sections now are going to go batshit crazy. Everybody's going to have an opinion, and I welcome that. Knock yourself out. I've got people who are atheists, and they are they are skeptical of things like Area 51, right? You know, there's some things going on. There are there are alien ships being hidden under the earth and, you know, those types of things. So where they might be, they might be pretty balanced when it comes to issues of, say, debunking the Abrahamic God and whatnot. They seem to be more Yeah, you know this book, uh, you know this book Area 51 by Annie Jacobson? Annie's a, um, you know, she's a LA Times journalist. She's a savvy, experienced journalist and most journalists that I meet are pretty skeptical because they've, you know, they've they've been around enough to know that people are are BSers and and they get they get uh, you know easily uh, bamboozled. So you know they're 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 savvy, thick-skinned skeptics. And yet she, you know, her whole book is premised on this w- one interview she had with this guy, <clears throat> this old guy that worked at Area 51, and uh, he just told her this tall tale of these you know genetically engineered alien-like beings that Stalin had created uh, during the Cold War and and that the Soviets had built these, you know, circular disc-shaped hovercraft that they sent over the North Pole and came into New Mexico, crashed in New Mexico, and all this was meant to, to uh, you know, throw the American economy into a chaos like a like a, you know, War of the Worlds, you know, radio broadcast kind of thing. I mean, this tale just goes, it's just absurd. It's at the end of her book. And, and uh, you know, so I met with her and said, do you really believe this? She goes, well, I believe my source. I said, yeah, I know, but, you know, people just make stuff up, right? Yeah. I mean, you're a journalist. People just make things up. I said, yeah, I know, but, he, you know, he, he just seems so trustworthy to me. I mean, oh, I no. please. <laughs> I mean, come on. Yeah, I know, but... <laughs> I mean, how does that and happen? I think that's a, how do you? How, how do you does that happen? Some... Well, I do encounter that a lot with people that they find it hard to believe that somebody would make up a fantastic story and call it true. And I said, my response is, well, you know, have you read like Harry Potter and the Lord of the Rings and you know the Star Wars trilogy and so on? I mean, they're not claiming it's true, and yet the, the, the human mind is quite capable of sort of imagining fantastic worlds. That never existed. The fact that some people just stamp nonfiction on the cover, that doesn't it doesn't change anything. You still have to evaluate in the context of how the world really is. It's like when I met Whitney Stryber. Whitley Stryber is the um, author of Communion, the most famous of the alien abduction books. Uh, his cover is the one that, that sort of launched the iconography of the alien head of that you know the sort of emaciated body and the big almond shaped eyes and no ears and. And so on. That's that's kind of how I got started. And so I met him in the green room at Bill Maher's show, the old show, um, Politically Incorrect on ABC. And um, we were on different segments. I was doing one on God with Julius Weeney, and he was doing one on aliens. Anyway, so I was chatting with him, and I knew about his book and stuff. So I said, well, you know, when you're not writing books about this, you know, what do you do for a living? Just just a friendly chat. He goes, oh, well, um, I write science fiction, fantasy, and horror books. I went, Oh, oh. <laughs> well, okay. You mean you just make shit up for a reason, for, for a living? Yeah. You just make stuff up for a living, and and this particular one, you stamp nonfiction on the cover. Okay, end of story. I don't, I don't need to do any further investigations on this. Now, the fact that somebody says it's true, you know, it does, you, you just, you're not obligated to take it seriously. I, another his famous Hitchens quote that I like, that's called Hitchens' principle is that which can, that which is asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. Real fast, I've done it in the past, but let's do it again. Let's tell me about the baloney detection kit, would you? Oh yes, well at skeptic.com we have the baloney detection kit inspired by Carl Sagan's book Demon Haunted World, in which you know, he presents and then we present an alternative version of this. The kinds of things you should be asking when you hear a claim, like, all right, who's making this claim? Who is this guy? Where, where does he come from? What's his background? Is he an expert in this field? Does he know anything about it? Does he have training? You know, it's not that outsiders can't make a contribution to a field. It's just that they they almost never do. 
you know, like all the alternative physics theories that people come up with, that, you know, that have no training in physics. You know, it's not impossible that they're, you know, right, and that all that Newton and Einstein and everybody was wrong in their and their little uh, you know, theory that they developed in their garage is, is right. It's not impossible. It's just very unlikely. So knowing something about who it is and and the claim that that's being made is it what's the context of it? Is it does it fit with the worldview that we know? Does it explain things that the present theory doesn't explain. For example, a lot of these alternative theories of physics claim to explain the anomalies that the current theory of physics can't explain. But can they explain the things we, we can explain? Um, usually not. Or um, you know, what's the quality of the evidence? Has anybody tried to refute it? Has, has, has there been any peer review? Has there been any experiments like cold fusion? You know, they held a press conference and announced that they had achieved cold fusion. There's energy too cheap to meters can change the world and so on. I remember when this happened in eighty nine. It was a fantastic story. Front page news all over the world. This is good. this is gonna save this is gonna you know, rescue humanity from our energy problems and uh, but no one had tested it. And and so once they they published it and gave everybody the parameters showing exactly what they did, everybody ran out to their labs and tested it and nobody could replicate it. End of story. So, you know, has somebody tried to replicate it is, you know, one of the most important things you can ask about a particular claim. And uh, so that's the baloney detection kit. That's probably a great uh, refutation to those who believe that all of science is in league to sort of put one over on the world. You know, it's all like a scientific conspiracy. And I think to myself, if, if a scientist publishes something, there's a litany of vipers out there waiting to take their research and go and disprove it, or at least put it to the test. I mean, the scientific community is largely pretty hard on itself, is it not? It is, yes. I mean, scientists are, you know, when you're in the sciences and you have to deal with um, you know, peer reviewers, it's a nasty business. I mean, they are really harsh. Uh, I mean, there's a, a built-in system that's probably good that, you know, when, when you review a paper, your job is to find things wrong with it. And then, you know, there's a cognitive bias there. Maybe you're being overly harsh. Maybe you're asking the the uh, the author to do things that really are not needed, but you're doing it because you feel like, as a reviewer, you need to find something wrong with the paper, or you're not doing your job as a reviewer. So that can be frustrating for somebody that writes papers. Uh, but in, you know, in the long run, I think it's good. It, it ferrets out uh, fraud and mistakes and errors and things like that. And, uh, it's not that these things don't slip through; they do. But um, but the conservative nature of science. I think it's important because most radical new ideas are wrong. It's like I like to say, you know, when they, they you know, the, they, the fringers say, well, you know, they laughed at the Wright brothers. And I say, yeah, well, they laughed at the Marx brothers. I mean, being laughed at doesn't make you right. <laughs> yeah. And for every Galileo that turned out to, you know, be right when he challenged the Aristotelian church system, um, you know, there's 10,000, you know, wannabe, Galileo wannabe that just, we never heard of them. Um, there's, a, there's a real bias there. And I call it the biography bias, like the Steve Jobs biography. Uh, you know, everybody who wants to pick apart Steve Jobs' life to see what he did, you know, what's the model to becoming a successful entrepreneur and inventor and creator and so forth? Oh, you have to go to, you know, go to a prestigious college and drop out and then go live in your parents' garage. You know, okay. Yeah. Uh, the problem is, is, you know, there, there were a thousand other Steve Jobs in the 70s that were trying this, that, and the other, and they all failed. And, and I, we don't even know who they are. I don't, we don't even know their names let alone have biographies written about them. And so, you know, there's the hindsight bias there where we're only going to, in hindsight, hear about the success stories. And, and that's true in all of science. We, you just don't hear about the non-Galileos that tried to come up with some alternative physics and cosmology. And, and they, they're just wrong or crazy, and we just never hear about them. One last thing before I let you go, and I have to bring it up again because I continue to receive links and emails and postings on my Facebook page saying you've got to watch this film series. It's called Zeitgeist. Can oh, you, yeah, Zeitgeist. Can you speak yeah, to Zeitgeist? I, Zeitgeist. Uh, I, I have a lot of people who are just now, it's just one of those things. It continues to be reintroduced to new people every single month or quarter or what have you. Can you address Zeitgeist very quickly for me? Yeah, and we, if you go to uh, skeptic.com and you just type into our search engine zeitgeist, you'll see we've addressed several of the claims. Part of the problem is it's a huge moving target. You know, it's multiple parts. Uh, you know, they have lots of different theories about this, that, and the other. And um, the problem is is that it, it mixes a lot of fact with error. And, and unless you know everything, 
uh, it's hard to debunk. You know, they have things about the Federal Reserve, and they have things about the origins of Christianity and the Middle Ages and history and economics and politics, and and it's like, whoa, uh, you know, who can who can be on top of all of that? And you can't. So we've piece, we've taken it apart piece by piece. It's for the most part, I'd say, you know, like ninety percent baloney and ten percent true. <laughs> and uh, so I wouldn't. My advice is don't take any of it seriously because there's wrong about so many things. I mean, they just say things that are just not true. And, uh, and and so the ones that might be true, you know, you just don't know. So uh, there's no trust. There's no trustworthiness there. There's there's no fact checking on the process. There's a problem with the internet, especially these YouTube videos that pass themselves off as documentaries. They're not. They're not documentaries. There's no fact checking. You're not watching a Nova program or a frontline investigation with a whole editorial staff cranking out fact check after fact check. This just doesn't happen with Zeitgeist or the other one, Loose Change, about 9-11. You know, they, you know, could it be this? Could it be that? I mean, they're as bad as the ancient alien show on the History Channel. <laughs> you know, this, is, this, is, this is bought and paid for and by the guys hosting it. I mean, it's it's a... It's a bit of a con to put it on the History Channel as if it was the History Channel itself with their team of reporters and investigators. No, no, no. It's just it's produced by a production company and just sold to the History Channel. Most people don't know how these these programs come about, but their production companies, most of them are here in L.A. And uh, what they do is they to make money to stay in business. They pitch all the networks different shows that they think they can sell. And stuff about conspiracy theories and Bigfoot and these sorts of things seem to do pretty well. And so they'll pitch it to the History Channel. If the History Channel buys it, say, um, it's just the production company's job to go produce it. There's no, like, team of editors at the History Channel that, like, vets these things and says, you know what, this is getting a little crazy. Maybe we ought to, you know, get involved in the production of these shows. No, they just buy them, and they just get them in the can, and they air them. So this is the problem with not just the Internet, but but most of cable television. You know, the idea of, like, ABC News and investigation with a team of reporters and editors and people off camera that are checking things before they put it on the air, that almost never happens anymore. And, uh, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that... Um, that the, the the downside of the internet it's it's made information free and instant which is great but you just don't know how much of it is true or not it almost forces the viewer to have to sort of become the investigative reporter to do the fact checking that yeah, was you, not done on the other end you know yeah i was i'm working on this uh we're doing a special issue of Skeptic on gun control and and mass murders and cuz the sandy hook elementary school shooting you know, it's time that skeptics took a look at this, and man, oh man, is this a complicated issue? And you know, half the web pages I've I found are just I, I can see they're not trustworthy. I mean, one of them I started reading is like, oh my, this is fantastic information. And then I look up to see what it is. It's this like white power website. Oh, I'm like, no. oh no, <laughs> oh my god, this thing is out of Idaho somewhere. Yeah, and I'm like, yeah. okay, click off. Uh, yeah. You know, there's just but there's hundreds like that. You really can't trust them. Well, and a lot of what I'm seeing is the statistics say crime is low in this country, which has this amount of guns. And the statistics say that the crime is high in this country and they have this amount of guns. And, of course, you know, I'm like, whoa, you know, well, where do the statistics come from? And what are the other mitigating factors? What's the culture like? What has the crime rate been like historically? What's, you know, what type of government do they have? What type of, uh, I mean, there's so many other things. I, I may not even know what to ask. I'm hoping maybe the skeptic article will go deep into some of those areas as well. Yeah, we, we're going super deep, and it is going to be a massive, long uh, series of articles we're going to publish. It's it's really good, but it, it, but it's hard. I mean, it's like I found that study in Australia where they, they imposed the uh, ban on assault rifles and shotguns in 1996 after a mass murder that killed, I think it was 31 people in Tasmania. So all the, the Australian governments agreed, okay, we're going to ban assault rifles and shotguns. Okay, so they did, and there hasn't been a single mass shooting since. So everybody holds that up on the gun control side. But then on the other side, they go, well, that's Australia. It's so different. It's a you know, much smaller population. <laughs> it's smaller population smaller than California. And, uh, it's, you know, it's very homogeneous compared to America. They they have other they, – they don't have a, a, a drug problem. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of our crime is related to drugs and gangs. And, uh, you know, that a lot of our higher murder rate – our murder rate is like – Five per 100,000, and it's less than one per 100,000 in Europe. So you know, five times higher than in Europe. But uh, but 
but we have you know inner city crime that uh, that drives up much of those um, those homicides, and Australia doesn't have anything like that. And so you ha- yeah, you have to control for all those other variables, and it's really not a simple answer, uh, a problem to solve. I've, I've concluded that we can never prevent Sandy Hook events. They're black swan events. They're rare, highly visible, emotionally salient, and and very unpredictable. I mean, just this morning, there's a story, a story just broke this morning on the AP wire that this Alabama high school teacher found in her, one of her students' notebooks, a journal he was keeping, a diagram of uh, the, how he was going to blow up the school. And so they, she turned it to the police. The police went to his house and they found all these cans he had uh, been, he had filled with pellets. And he had explosive, uh, you know, material. And he, they said he was like two steps away from these being little bombs. He was going to set them off in his high school and in the journal. He even listed who he wanted to kill. Um, okay, so that that involves no guns at all. <laughs> and you know, just a, a high school kid, you can find all this stuff on the internet how to build these little uh, homemade device, explosive devices. And and the sheriff is quoted as saying, "The system worked. What system?" The teacher found it. The teacher turned it over to the police, and the police went to his house. There's no system. This isn't like gun control works. The government has saved us again. No, it, you know, a private citizen. I mean, the only thing I can recommend is that we all just become more alert. And if you have, you know, your crazy cousin Jerry who's gone off the deep end, and all of a sudden you notice he's ordered, you know, 100,000 rounds of ammunition, and he's buying camouflaged flak jackets, Maybe it's time to call the police. You know, that's the kind of thing that that, that I think is our only hope. You know, that whatever you ban, and, and and handguns will never be banned because the, the Supreme Court has ruled twice in 2008 and 2010 uh, that it's unconstitutional to ban handguns. So that's never going to happen. And uh, so you can you can ban this, that, and the other rifle. It doesn't matter. Even if you banned all guns and collected all 300 million guns in America and, and no one had a gun, uh, you'd still have people building cans with pellets in them and explosive devices. You, you're not going to stop it. I look forward uh, to the article in Skeptic Magazine. I d- want to thank you for your time. I encourage everybody to check out the website, skeptic.com. Subscribe to the magazine and support the work that these guys are doing. And, of course, Michael is on TV about every five minutes. He's slumming today on doing the show with me. <laughs> and uh, It is much appreciated. I, I love what you do. Um, I, I appreciate the good humor that you bring to often difficult arguments, and I'm glad to know that you're out there sort of representing us, man. Thanks, and I appreciate your work, too. I love your work. It's just great. So we're all doing our share every little bit. All of us have a uh, – just pushing the football down the field, just keeping the thing going, making the world a little bit more rational each year, hopefully. Michael Shermer of Skeptic Magazine. Um, he mentioned, or was it someone in the chat room who was talking about the History Channel? Yeah, we were actually talking about um, – how the, those shows are sold, and someone on the chat room sort of took it and ran with it, and had a great point. And, and you know, there's a, there's several blogs on the issue of the History Channel, and where has their programming gone? It, it used to be that you made fun of the History Channel because it was all World War II. All of it was the Hitler Channel, it seemed, and that was the running gag. But here in the last several years, the History Channel has become sort of like sci-fi. When UFOs Arrive is a show. Ancient Aliens. Um, Deep Sea UFOs. Red Alert. Haunted History. Swamp People. (laughs) Exorcism. Driving Out the Devil. UFO Hunters. Excuse me? Now, there's a few of those shows. I mean, I get some of it. I watch Pawn Stars. I know the show is totally staged. Look, if you have some, I saw somebody walk in. I was watching the show. This was months ago. And he walks into the pawn shop in Las Vegas, right? The Pawn Stars pawn shop. And he has a supposedly authentic piece of Houdini memorabilia. And he's going in to pawn it or to sell it to the pawn shop. And I'm screaming at the television set, really? In the age of the internet, when you can find collectors like that. You can serve your niche like that and find a buyer who will pay you full price, if not more. You're walking into the pawn shop in Las Vegas with an authentic piece of Houdini memorabilia. It's bogus. <laughs> and it's still I find myself watching it. I mean, like Storage Wars. 
when storage units are abandoned. And they show these guys going from storage units that have been abandoned by their owners for whatever reason or defaulted upon. 150 people are all gathered around the storage unit. And it seems to be just the same five people who, uh, who win the bid. Now, what's that about? Really? The five show characters just happen to be the ones who are the top bidders on every single locker? Are you kidding me? And, and I find myself, I'm, maybe I'm part of the problem by leaving the television on. I'm like, oh, look what they found in the back there. That's an old school phonograph record. That's probably worth some money. Mm, we need to see what this is worth. Let's take it to my buddy, my expert friend, who happens to be an authority on the subject of old phonographs and see what it's worth. And they drive there and they go through this whole thing. <laughs> oh, the History Channel. Where have you gone? Here's a message from Julie. She said, Dr. Jack Kevorkian is a hero of mine for reasons that actually have very little to do with his euthanasia campaign. Now, for those who aren't familiar with Dr. Jack Kevorkian, they called him Dr. Death. And he was one of those people who believed in physician-assisted suicide. When you choose to end your life, let's say you, for any reason, come to a point where you feel life is not worth living, he believed you should have the right to hook yourself up or have even a physician hook you up to a machine. And he, he would do this. He would, I think, take a van uh, someplace other than someone's home or his home or a hospital or a public building, and they'd put him in like a vehicle or something. And they would, uh, they'd they be lying there comfortably, and he would give them a... It looked like an IV, and it had several different buttons on it. And he would give the control to the patient and essentially would assist them as they ended their own life. Hugely controversial, and I want to talk more about my own perspectives on Kevorkian here in just a second, but first let me do due diligence with Julie's email. She said, he was a multi-talented, brilliant, fascinating, renaissance man. He taught himself several languages to the point of fluency, and he played the piano, harpsichord, and the flute. He did a bunch of wonderfully bizarre oil paintings, made a movie in the 70s, and hosted a one-man public access show in the 80s. He was also an inventor, and yes, he built his famous suicide machine, but also built a water bike and a bicycle that worked without a chain. Dr. Kevorkian also knew a great deal about just about every topic you could think of. He was very rational when it came to things like religion. He stopped going to Sunday school when his teacher couldn't answer his questions about why Jesus could walk on water and perform other miracles and yet would not stop the Armenian genocide, which killed most of Kevorkian's extended family. Julie continues, in his interviews later in life, he referred to religion as mythology and generally gave good arguments about why many aspects of religion are so ridiculous. One of my favorite lines from an interview he did on Fox News in 2009 is this, quote, when you transplant a heart from a baboon into a baby, as we did, and you say the body of that baby is sacred, does that profane heart from the baboon become sacred when you place it in the body? Or when you take out a gallbladder and throw it in the garbage, is that a sacred gallbladder in the garbage? Or as soon as it's out of the body, it loses its sanctity? You see the silliness of our mythology. Children ask the questions I'm just asking now. Trouble is, children get slapped for asking questions like that because they have no defense. But you can't slap me. I can ask the question. It's a logical question. Unquote. Julie continues. And yet he had a conspiracy theory about the government, similar to the Illuminati. He believed that there was a group of people who controlled the world's economy and planned to gradually take away our rights until we are literally enslaved. He called this group of people the tyrant. He protested this perceived enslavement by refusing to wear a seatbelt in the car because he thought it was a stupid law. If someone's willing to accept the personal consequences, which he clearly stated he was, that's fine. But apparently he didn't think of the other possibility that if he got into an accident, he could go through a windshield and kill somebody else. Of all the things he fought for, I can't believe the seatbelt law isn't one of them. He also refused to use a license plate toward the end of his life because of this perceived encroachment of rights. Needless to say, he didn't drive very far. After eight years in prison, he didn't want to deal with law enforcement again. Dr. Kevorkian once said that it's up to the black people to unite to stop this tyrant because they know what slavery is 
Face palm. Julie finishes. You want your heroes to be perfect, but they never are. I read in Shermer's The Believing Brain that it's often the most brilliant people who have conspiracy theories. They're so good at recognizing patterns that this mechanism, for lack of a better word, works too well. And then they see patterns that aren't there. It makes sense, I suppose. We all see the clear injustices on the part of the government. And a brilliant man takes that reality and inflates it to a conspiracy theory. Julie in New York, thank you very much for the message. It's funny because when I was a believer, I feel like I preface, I don't know how many stories with that, forgive me. But it's true, when I was a believer, we would talk about Dr. Death, Dr. Kevorkian. And the argument was, leave the medical profession out of it. Don't taint the medical profession. Now, I'm not, I mean, I know that opinions vary on physician assisted suicide. It's a very complex issue. I get that. I will only tell you where, where I fell. Beforehand, I was thinking it's suicide. Now, I didn't, I didn't personally hold to the belief that suicide means you go to hell. And I know that like in the Catholic faith and many others, if you kill yourself, you are automatically damned. That's part of their doctrine. And I never held to that. I just, I, to me, it was always, did you accept Jesus Christ? That determines heaven or hell. But the idea of someone helping someone else take their own life to me was an affront. It was difficult for me to digest. It was hard for me to see it as a moral act. And now looking back on the life of this man, I find myself personally feeling a sense of admiration for the stand he took. You know, there's, there's living and then there's just existing. And there are many people who decided that rather than waste away, right? They are a physical, emotional, and financial drain on everyone around them. They don't want that grieves them. They don't want that for themselves. Their quality of life is nil. Often people who used to be able to, to run like the wind, who had all of their senses, who were able to take life by the horns to be able to own their own their own actions be able to just to be even relatively independent even partially independent who see a potential future where they are bedridden waiting to die they know recovery will never come they're marking time they're passing the heartbeats just waiting for the last one and it might be weeks months years Decades? I don't know. And they decide, no, this is my life. I'm going to decide how I live and how long I live. I look at that now as something I feel should be supported. And, and I know it's a complex thing. Every situation must be examined. I get that. But I look at Kevorkian and I, I don't think he was crazy. I think if someone says, I'm going to be in a vegetative state shortly, or I'm going to simply be bedridden and staring at the ceiling and I, I can't do, I can't be, I can't achieve anything. My life is, you know, I, I, I know that this is as good as it's going to get. Do they have the right to stop the clock? I kind of think, yeah. I don't celebrate it, but it's, you know, it's your life. It's your life, right? Funny how perceptions can change with uh, a few years and uh, with an objective look at, uh, at new arguments and uh, suggestions out there. 316, thank you for waiting. You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. What's your name? Hi, this is Jimmy from Wichita, Kansas. Jimmy, glad you called. What's going on, man? Yeah, I'm kind of uh, going to discuss maybe a little bit about, like, uh, education and health care. Um, my thoughts is, uh, you know, it seems like that they're so quick to uh, cut funding for, say, education. And um, I've worked in the mental health field for, like, 15 years. And doing this, I've actually worked with uh, kids who were troubled, who needed certain cares in the classroom, like um, I actually had a kid who uh, who had like ADHD and and some defiant disorders, things of that nature. 
But because, you know, funding cuts, I mean, it just seems like they're so quick to cut funding for the school. Like, actually, we actually closed uh, five schools in Wichita. But then on one note, they also talk about erecting, like, a spending, like, $1.8 million on a statue. And to me, that just sounds kind of kind of ludicrous when I think education is, is very important um, as far as also the healthcare aspect of it. And it kind of just reminds me of the uh, Connecticut shooting. Um, I think that that is very important, that sort of thing. We'll tie this into the unskeptical atheism theme of our show. Do you Are you saying that there are many people who look at the mental health issue in an unskeptical way? I, you know, I think so. It, it just, it just seems like, um, it just seems like they're always so quick to, uh, as far as like cut funding to uh, the education system. But, you know, it seems like that they're, they're always ready to like. There's always funding to like build a church or, or uh, put the uh, even, you know, uh, uh, tax money into things like we got this new arena, and things like that. Um, that sort of thing. Well, it's, you know, it's funny, uh, you know, I, it, it's a fact of life that like some of the most popular universities pour how many mm -hmm. tens of millions of dollars into their athletics program, which are often the driving yeah. identifier for their university. And, and when it comes right. to the actual teaching portion of the university of the four year or whatever degree it is, well, those tend to go on the mm -hmm. back burner. I mean, I understand those types of things. I, I don't know that, um, better schools would have prevented Sandy Hook. I, I don't know that that's the right. case, but I see your larger point that yeah. quite frankly, people, my challenge is, is that everybody seems to have a soapbox. Everybody seems to knee jerk and everybody has yeah. a tendency to want to blame society for individual problems. And in my yeah. mind, that's a problem. I, I think to myself, you know, it, it, I don't know if it's a victim mentality or, or, you know, some kind of self-loathing. It's us. We did it. We created this. Well, yeah. not necessarily. That that kind of bothers me, though. So. Yeah, that's just a big thing. And um, and that sort of thing. And also, I've been a uh, I was part of this uh, atheist group, of course, um, you know, with school and and work. I'm, I'm not as as much into it like I, I would like to be. You know, life happens, but um, we had this idea, or, or the guy who was running it during that time was like, well, let's depict Muhammad. Let's have like a Muhammad drawing day where we're going to like put postings of pictures of Muhammad and stuff like that, like around the campus, um, which I disagreed and I thought it was a bad idea because I actually, I'm a computer science major and in a lot of these classrooms, there's, there's Muslims, you know, there's quite a bit. And I'm not saying that if they see like a picture of Muhammad that they're going to cause a riot or anything like that. I just, just thought it was a bad idea while stir up, you know, this is my school, this is where I go. And, and, you know, that sort of thing. I mean, you think of like Virginia tech, you know, those kind of incidents, instances that happen. So do you oppose like it though, because you fear retribution or do you oppose it because you simply don't want to take that tack with the Muslims that attend the school? Because you don't um, want to offend them or you don't want to stir the pot in that 50, way. 50 on both. Don't get me wrong. As an atheist, I mean, I am. I don't care for the Muslim, well, any religion at all. I'm very critical about, you know, religion in general. It's just, uh, I just, basically, I. it's kind of 50-50. On one end, I, like, I don't want to see anybody get hurt. I don't think that to draw a, a picture of Muhammad would be a... Some just to, you know, cause a problem with some of the Muslims that were around the school, things like that. And also, I mean, you know, some of those, you know, some of them are, you know, really nice people, too, you know. Um, I, of course, I don't think all of them are, are uh, as like, uh, well, you As you devout? Know. Yeah, as yeah, devout, yeah. Casual. That's yeah. the word. Yeah. Well, I, uh, you know, I, I hear you. I, I appreciate your perspective. Anything else for me before I move on? Yeah, I'm. I'm gonna go uh, get your book. I didn't know if there's any chance you might be able to come to Wichita, Kansas, or actually, um, I'm. I'm coming to. Uh, I'm doing a sh a small book tour. I don't want to take the, too much of the show to slug it, but I'm doing. Okay. I'm working right now with the atheist group in Kansas City. 
Uh, I'm hoping to get Wichita on it, and we're doing a bunch in Texas. We've got Amarillo and Houston lined up. I'm working on Dallas and San Antonio. Um, That's going to be the week before the American Atheist Convention uh, on the final weekend in March. Uh, Looks like I'm doing a few Oklahoma dates, including one uh, in uh, Tulsa in February, and I think Oklahoma City in late February, early March. So I'm limited a little bit because I do have a job and a life as to how long and how far I can go and how much time I can spend away. But uh, I am working on trying to put together a deal. So if we do Kansas, if we do Wichita, I'll make sure everybody in the Facebook page knows about it, okay? Oh, awesome. Thanks a lot, man. All right. Take care of yourself. Thank you. You too. You know, the Draw Muhammad Day is is uh, that's probably a whole other show. There are probably two sides to it in my mind. The first is, yeah, it will antagonize the Muslim. I don't see it as a productive way to have a discussion about it with the Muslim in your circle. Someone who believes the Quran and prays to Allah five times a day. I, I, the Dra Muhammad really isn't designed to do that. The Dra Muhammad day really was designed more than anything as an overwhelming statement of opposition to the, the threats that radical Islam takes. Obviously, if you... According to their doctrine, if you depict Muhammad, if you draw Muhammad in any way, you are uh, a target. You have, it's the ultimate sacrilege, you know, blasphemy. And of course, they come at you with threats of all sorts of stuff, including execution. And the thinking was, look, these threats abide because we allow them to abide. If tens and tens and tens of thousands of people were to all simultaneously draw Muhammad. There would be so many people, so many depictions, so much material out there that it would be impossible, impractical for the radical Islamists to make good on their threats. It would be an overwhelming statement of defiance against the threats toward non-Muslims and, uh, and that I support. I actually participated the first year. I think I drew a Muhammad at Hooters. <laughs> I didn't draw him. I think I photoshopped him or something. <laughs> he's surrounded, but he's around a bunch of Hooters girls. I just thought it was funny. But the overall deal is you are not going to threaten us. You are not going to quiet us. You are not going to tell us we, we know what we can and cannot say. You can disagree with it. You can even be offended by it. Knock yourself out. But you cannot tell us you are going to kill us. Uh, It just doesn't work. And the Draw Muhammad Day phenomenon continues. I believe the originator of it actually backed out. But in many incarnations, I know Thunderfoot has done a lot on it. In fact, he did a deal where he uh, just it's also I believe it's uh, uh, an act worthy of I don't know if it's worthy of death or not to destroy the Quran. And uh, he created, I don't know how many copies of the Quran on a computer hard drive. I mean, thousands upon thousands of Korans on the computer hard drive and destroyed the drive. And it's a statement of defiance. Look, you will not quell us. You will not threaten us. We will not kowtow to your threats is the general idea. And I do support that. Area code 951. You're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. Who's this? Hey, what's up, Seth? This is Corey. Corey, thanks for calling. What's up? Hey, uh, my best friend or one of my best friends, is an unskeptical atheist. <laughs> Does he know uh, or she know that you're calling the show today to talk about them? I, they don't. Okay. Well, I'll try to keep it that way for you. We got a few listeners oh, out no, there. He, he, I know he's not, and it's a he, but I know he's not listening to the show. All right. Well, talk about all it. Right. So that's all good. That's all good. So, <laughs> no skin off my teeth, but, man. Um, Just, what do you, what's the story on this person? Well, we we know each other because we used to go to the same church. Um, we grew up in the same church, and that's how we know each other. We used to go to the, the youth group and cell groups and, you know, the whole deal. Um, <laughs> but I'm the one who became an atheist first. And when he found out about it, you know, he didn't have a problem with it, but he challenged me a lot with my, with my, and my moral foundation. Okay. I'm uh, losing you, my friend. I'm losing you. 
Are you adjusting a microphone there? No. All right. I got you back. Go ahead. Continue. But, um, one, we got into a huge argument one time, and he told me about, it was this claim that they found the skeleton in Arkansas, okay? And supposedly, the skeleton threw, is a hoax and is a huge missing link in the story of evolution. And I'm like, well, I've never heard of this before, and also we don't only look at the skeletons, we also look at the DNA. But uh, anyways, a couple weeks later, I was looking at this bookshelf, and there's this thing called, there's, there was this book, and it was called The Evidence Bible. And I took a look at it, and on the front cover, it was endorsed by Rain Comfort and Kurt Cameron, and instantly I took most of, the, most of it out the window, and I took pretty much no credibility with it because of past instances where they made absolutely no sense to make claims that were unfounded and baseless. But I saw the same diagram that he described to me in that Bible, the evidence Bible, where they said that they brought out scientific evidence supporting religion and Christianity first and foremost. But last week you talked about how being having an open discussion, not telling that person that they're wrong, but just having an open discussion and having an open mind, open mind with that person uh, is the best approach because when I use that approach with them, he started to come around. Well, it's it's the best approach for some. I mean, that's, I don't want to give a blanket statement, but I mean, I think if you're, you know, there are some people, look, if I saw William Lane Craig on the street, I'm not taking a soft, I mean, you know, it's a, <laughs> the soft hand does not work with the right comfort and, and, uh, and those guys, the Kirk oh, Cameron. Oh, it doesn't. It but, doesn't. But you the people that you and I deal guys. with in our everyday lives, I think, yeah, I mean, don't be a jerk about it. Exactly. But, and it worked for you, huh? Exactly. It, it worked because we, we went to the gym and I sort of talked to him about it, having discussions. And first he, he didn't, he, he put up a wall, but after that, he started being open about it and started to share the same views as I did. And it really, it, like I said, it really worked and it was very efficient. Sounds good. So this person is no longer an unskeptical person or are they an atheist? Are they a uh, believer? I mean, give me an um, exclamation point on the there, end. I here. mean, he, he, he still, there, there still are some beliefs. He is still coming around to evolution. He's still coming around to the Big Bang. He's starting to see the evidence of it and starting to contrive his own views and senses world based on it but um like the ancient aliens he was really into he was really <laughs> into the first season <laughs> and the, and so, you know that kind of stuff makes me crazy yeah uh, yeah look the no one can explain how the pyramids were built it must be ancient aliens dun 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 you know <laughs> yeah it makes no sense and i also learned through the history of mankind which i thought was amazing uh yeah what's it called that the history of mankind or something like that but uh they basically said for actually it it wasn't all slaves. There were actual people whose trade was stone cutting and whatnot. A lot of the claims that the ancient aliens, people, the supporters make, you look at the evidence and it falsifies them. Yeah. And their claims are very delicious. But, um, well, I'm glad yeah, to hear I mean, your friend I mean, is starting to come around and develop a worldview of his own rather than just assuming an inherited worldview of someone else. So Yeah, and I used to have the same problem when I was when I was religious. Um, Skepticism, you know, doubt is a beautiful things. thing. So it is a beautiful thing. It is a beautiful thing. Yeah. But um, so I thought if my thoughts weren't you know, Man, you did fine. I'm a little nervous right now. You did fine. Uh, I'm glad you called the show. I'm well, glad you're listening. And, and, you know, someday down the pike, if your buddy gets to the point where he's comfortable, have him tune in as well. He's welcome to call and we'll chat. It'd be, it'd be an honor. Okay. Okay. All no right. problem. Take it easy. Thank you. You ever watch those shows? I don't know why I'm bringing this up. You ever watch those? And by the way, I'm taking the show a little bit long today because I knew I was going to spend some extra time with Shermer and I wanted to have some time, some extra time to, to uh, communicate and, and share your calls and emails. But you ever watch those shows, the uh, those ghost hunter or paranormal shows? And there's a bunch of them. And I understand why they're compelling. I mean, I used to enjoy them more than I do. Where they would throw a camera rig on somebody, right? He's got a shoulder cam and he's got a helmet cam and he's got 
you know, he's got thermal, some kind of thermal camera, and he's got all these things, everything from divining rods to I don't know what he's got. And they throw him in this house all night. And did you did you feel that the temperature dropped twenty five degrees in two feet? Here, come here, Buford, come here, stand right here, <laughs> man. Wait, did something just touch me on the shoulder? I felt something just touch me on the... Buford, come here. Come here, stand right here. I mean, just one of those things. <laughs> you know, and I, I love a good ghost story. Those of you who've heard our Halloween shows know that I love a good ghost story. I love a good scare. I, Halloween's my favorite holiday. I would love to spend the night in a supposedly haunted house. I would, I would enjoy it. I would uh, even I might even get spooked by it. It's it's an experience. But I'll tell you what, if if someone said, look, there's a orb flying around in your camera. Well, I'm a professional videographer. I'm, I'm my first thought's going to be, uh, all right, wait a minute. Yeah, clean your lens. Uh, what's the circular that dust being circulated by something? Oh, it's just flying against the, the current of the air. It couldn't be dust. And, you know, time and again, you see these things completely debunked. And, and half the time, they're just scaring each other to death. Look, you take anybody and throw them out in the woods in the middle of the night in a supposedly haunted cemetery. I don't care who they are. There's a good chance they're going to get freaked. They're going to hear a, a twig break or they're going to hear a coyote howl or something. Or they're just going to hear something inside their own head and flip. Oh, my gosh. And there are a lot of people. There are a lot of people I know in the free thought community who. And you'd be surprised at how many who who think that there may be ghosts or there may be something. I honestly, I categorize those spirits in the same category as any other religious supernatural entity or deity or you know it's like your spirit animal or whatever those those beings are i lumped them all together look it's all anecdotal unless you show me real proof and i don't mean sticking buford in here with a thermal camera look that closet door just opened by itself that is your aunt milda and milda's trying to tell you something she's sending you a message from the other world it's totally subjective, totally for TV. A lot of it is just theater. Do I think things have happened that people can't explain? Of course. But just because you can't explain it, I think, doesn't mean you get to automatically trust the hairs on the back of your neck. Trust that what you thought you heard, what you thought you saw. This speaks back to the anecdotal evidence that is used to defend religion. I was taken up in a chariot toward heaven. I had a vision. Jesus was there and he talked to me. I heard his voice. It was audible, you see. And he told me that I was the most loved creature on the planet. And I was on a mission for him. And then I felt myself bathed. Enjoy. I, you never felt an experience like it. It was like, it was like I had taken a swim in the ocean of happiness and bliss. And then he reached down and he took his little fingers and he just dropped me down on the planet Earth again. Now, I wasn't sleeping. I was conscious the whole time. You can't tell me that this did not happen. This is proof. I, no one will ever tell me that it didn't happen to me. Well, I, I honestly, I have to put ghosts and ghost hunters in the very same category. If they're not cashing in, I got a feeling this is the same kind of thing, the same anecdotal stuff that we have to brush off if we're searching for scientific evidence. 916, you're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. Who's this? This is Bryce. Bryce, thanks for calling. Thanks for waiting. What's going on? I uh, just quick comment, too, is just um, I recently discovered your show on your site. And it's been a huge in inspiration for me, and I appreciate it. Just wanted to thank you for that. It's my pleasure. Are you a lifelong uh, non-believer, or did you just recently emerge from some kind of religion? I emerged from myself. I'm still clawing my way up, but, you know, I'm getting there. Don't beat um, yourself up, man. It, take to, it took a lot of us a lot of years. Just do it on your timing and <laughs> keep asking questions, and it's going to be a hell of a ride, okay? Oh, no, I already, I already got through the hell part. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, no, I'm originally from California, actually, and I, I moved to Utah to be spiritually reborn, and we all see how well that went, if you ask my friends. Um, so, anyway, back to my point, your, your, uh, your topic is about un, unskeptical skeptics. Yeah. So, I, and you 
probably experienced this time and time again where you're watching something on TV or the Internet and you're having a debate about God or religion or some sort of thing about the Bible or the Koran, and they get tied up. And you're like, I know that. I know I know the answer to that and why he's getting confused. I, I understand the misconception there. And what I'm getting at here is it really – I'm a pretty firm believer in, you know, Blanca Carta. You know, we're all products of our environment. So, you know, with that in mind – you have to take that into all account. When you're raised, like, you know, I was raised Mormon, obviously, and when you're raised and told that this is the way the world is, and you begin, you get extremely emotional, emotionally attached to it, you know, it becomes your life. And, you, you know, you love it to death. And then, like, for myself, when you get to be about 18, you're like, well, I'll hang on, that doesn't quite, quite make sense, because in order to live in today's world, you still have to make certain logical deductions and conclusions about things, and if you can't do that, well, it's going to be a very disappointing life for you. So, you know, when you, you, your, your thought process is tied up this way, you know, this is, yeah, God loves me, this is the way that everything works, I just got to trust Him, and then you start realizing it's not quite that easy. And when you have a, a, a mind that's somewhere around the ballpark of 11 billion neurons, it's a slow process. It's funny because many of our religious cultures actually say things like, look, you're thinking too much. You're thinking way too oh, hard about oh. this. Yeah, you, you could give me talking for hours about that. When I was in high school, my institute teacher told me, you know, Bryce, you know, do the gates of heaven slide open or swing open? doesn't matter as long as, he's at, as, long as they open. <laughs> I'm asking so many questions. And I'm like, are you kidding? <laughs> you know, you, know you, you really get upset about it. And so... You know, this has kind of been a process for me over the last four or five years. You know, I saved up nine grand to go to a mission, decided not to, because I didn't feel right about it, and uh, moved to Utah instead. But um, when you start, we start asking these questions like this. Like for me, it was the honest. Yeah, well, I almost used a pun there. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I do. I do it all the time. Honest <laughs> to God. Yeah, thank God. Yeah, I, I slide God. into it all the time. <laughs> no, it's honestly an yeah. honest what. It, it was just. You restructure the way that your mind works, and because you have to, because I wanted it to be true, I honestly wanted it to be true. But you can't fool yourself. At least I couldn't fool myself and just say, "Oh, well, I'm just not going to worry about that." You know, I'm just going to ignore that because I'm not the type of person I am. My good. parents taught me to be logical. Well, good for you. Maybe that was a bad idea. Good for you. Well, honestly, there. I think people. I think people need the. There are those people who, when they walk into a room, if they see others who do not agree with them they feel they must convince you or they either can't hang out with you. They can't connect with you. And I think that speaks to often a personal insecurity, right? What kind of person can't stand shoulder to shoulder with someone else who has a disagreeing viewpoint and not be, Hey, how, how's it going? Good to see you. You know, let's all right, fine. We disagree. Great. How, how, how are the other things in your life? There are some people it's funny. I was on an airplane I was reading like an atheist book or so. I'm sure it was probably, uh, Oh, who, I can't remember who it was. And someone sitting next to me, you should, they started to bounce, like vibrate in their chair. They couldn't take it. And they're like, oh, you don't really believe this stuff, do you? You don't really believe that, do you? Like they couldn't take it. They had to convince me. And that was the longest 90 minutes in the air, I swear. <laughs> like that'll save your soul. Because if you don't, you know, the other 1,000 religions around, are, you're going to get a go out for those too. And of course they finish it with, uh, you know what? I'm going to be praying for you. I'm going to be praying that good, the Lord's going to show you. And I'm just going to, and I'm like, yeah, just, yeah. You have a nice day. Thanks. Thanks for flying Yahweh Airlines. Have a nice day. <laughs> I wish you the best in your journey, my friend. Uh, trust me, I, I was religious 30 years. I'll ne I'd never go back. I, no matter how happy or blissful or how much life purpose I thought I had or any of those things, I would never go back. And I wish you a, a fulfilled and happy, skeptical life, my friend. Have a good night. Bye. All right. An atheist in Utah. Whew. They need you. <laughs> they, they need you. I want to do a little... Uh, uh, just a little housekeeping right here and sort of let everybody know what we have coming up. I um, have added a module on the thinkingatheist.com homepage, which has a calendar of upcoming events, including uh, when the book tour dates come in, those will be on there. 
and probably more importantly, the upcoming podcasts. I know they're always listed on blogtalkradio.com, but those who uh, listen or, or link up through the main website, you'll actually be able to see a listing of the shows that are coming up. And I usually try to schedule them six to eight weeks in advance. Almost all shows are defined by topic. They're not just numbered, but they are actually a themed show. And I'm trying to continue that. We've had to recover some. I mean, this is, we've covered much of this ground before, but you know, we always seem to find new trails, new avenues to go. And there's always um, a, a good way to sort of tackle it in a fresh perspective. Coming up next Tuesday on the 15th, we're doing a show called Atheism and Sexuality. It's going to be a fascinating show. I've got uh, Dr. Daryl Ray going to join us. Greta Christina is going to join us. Uh, Zinnia Jones is going to weigh in uh, your calls and emails as we talk about sexuality outside of the biblical construct, outside of the man-woman uh, relationship that is supposedly condoned and endorsed by God. And we'll talk about does does atheism speak specifically to human sexuality? If you reject a deity, are you then more free to be whoever you are? And we'll talk about what that is and address various articles on the subject. A lot of people are going to want to sort of weigh in on it. You're welcome to email podcasts at thethinkingatheist.com. On the 22nd of January, we're going to talk with David Silverman, who's had a huge run, especially on the wake of the Reason Rally. We're going to talk to him. And I know the uh, American Atheist 50-year anniversary convention is coming up. We'll talk about that. Just and just stuff. I want to find out what it's like sitting across from O'Reilly, and how hard was it just not to reach across the counter and just throttle the guy? <laughs> yeah, you know, you got to hand it to Silverman. He puts himself in. You know, he's on Hannity, you know, the most hostile environment. Hannity doesn't even let him finish his sentence. Over, over there at Fox. Hannity just steamrolls over him, takes that nauseating, morally con, uh, morally superior, condescending tone. And yet David continues to go out because he thinks, well, you know, the message is getting out, even if it's on the Hannity show, even if it's on O'Reilly. On the 29th of January, we're doing a producer's workshop. This is a niche show, but I actually think it'll be fun for people who are not video or audio producers to listen in, maybe a behind the scenes look. And this would just be one guy's opinion, but I've had a lot of up and coming YouTubers say, look, can you give me some tips? And it's just one guy's opinion, but we'll talk a little bit about some of the traps that people fall into in the production room and producing audio and video or recording conventions or trying to just uh, not screw up in the production room. And then in February, we're going to do a show with Matt Dillahunty and we're going to focus on the tactics that the church uses to target children. This is something that is near and dear to my heart. Having come from a devoutly religious home, a product of Christian schools, I have seen firsthand the tactics that the church uses to go specifically after our youngest and most impressionable. And it makes me crazy. Uh, you know, everything from cartoons to uh, children's programming to soft playgrounds to Easter egg hunts to overnight lock ins to you name it. You know, they're going after children and it'd be innocuous enough if they were simply doing activities for the sake of getting kids together and having fun in a safe, secure environment. But ultimately, the end zone is not getting kids together in a safe, secure environment. The end zone is to indoctrinate them with the story of Jesus, an anticipation of heaven and a fear of hell. And so we uh, sort of address specifically why and how they go after our youngest and most impressionable. And we'll do that show on um, in the, the middle of February. Thank you so much for being my guest tonight, for allowing me into your life and uh, for supporting the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. You can catch us on Facebook and check out our YouTube page. And of course, we are online, thethinkingatheist.com. Have a wonderful week. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. Watch dozens of original videos on The Thinking Atheist YouTube channel. And visit our website for resources, links, contact information, the editor's blog, and more. TheThinkingAtheist.com